Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Frank Garitti. Um, I will tell you all about Professor Garitti in just a moment. But Grace Under Pressure is that show that deals with what's often dismissed as the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment we exert toward others. And uh, when you do it as a leader and in leadership positions, as you will definitely discover that the professor is, you do it with a common cause, bring people together to, for greater understanding. Frank Garitti, welcome to Grace Under Pressure. So, Thank you for having me, John. It's a pleasure to be on. Great. I want to tell everybody about you. Frank Garitti is an award-winning historian, author of three books. He's a history and African-American studies professor uh, and executive director of the Eric Holder Institute for Civil and Political Rights in Columbia University. His newest book is what we're going to talk about today called The Stadium, an American history of politics, protests, and play. Welcome, Frank Garitti. So, Thanks again for reading the book and for having me on. It's always uh, good to know that somebody's reading your work and giving it its uh, giving it their time and energy. Of course, I'm going to put you right on the spot right away. Uh, would you read from the opening of the book because it captures everything that I think your book uh, addresses? So, sure. So the 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 sure. I'm happy to read. This is the in the as the. As the book starts, it actually starts with the scene at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn during the summer of 2020, when many activists came together to grieve the, the loss of uh, George Floyd, who was murdered by the police in Minneapolis at that time, a very tumultuous time, as, which is now four years ago. And what happens is the Barclays Center in Brooklyn becomes like an epicenter of, of activism during that summer and, and even years before that. And so I use that as a way to talk about the multiple uses and the multiple meanings of stadium spaces. And I end that passage with the following passage, uh, that section with the following passage. The stadium has never had a singular meaning or purpose. It is a vessel marked by and filled with society's aspirations and conflicts. The social and political dimensions of the American stadium story should not be surprising because these aspects first appeared in the stadium environment thousands of years ago. And I'm referring to the very famous Roman Colosseum, which is still standing, at least somewhat, uh, and, to, and that being a, a, a structure that literally was about staging the ancient empire's aspirations and conflicts and its, and its commonalities. And so that's how I start the book. Great. Well, it's wonderful. I love how you synopsis. So um, I am a, an amateur historian. I love reading about history and writing about it in sort of second, third, fourth hand. Uh, but what struck you? What, what drew you to a topic of the stadium? I never would have thought about that. Of course, that's yeah. probably a positive. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad. I mean, that's the point. It's again, to rethink what we what we think we know about this building, these buildings that really populate, that really stand in, in cities and towns all over the country and all over the world. They're ubiquitous. Yeah. So, I mean, the book really started with, you know, my own experiences going to baseball games and, you know, the circus and basketball games growing up in New York City here with my, with my dad and my parents, my dad in particular. You know, I think a lot of us get fascinated by these buildings, you know, through that story. I mean, there's countless stories like that of fathers and sons going to games. And then, and then, and then, but as I got older and as I became a historian and a scholar, I, and, and then witnessing what's transpired in our country, certainly over the last 10 years, where the world of politics and sports have collided in multiple ways, and usually at the stadium or the arena, you know, it became clear to me that, 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 this, that the stadium is, is an institution. It's a place where, you know, we come together to root for teams, to see our favorite concert performers. Uh, it's where we go see the Democrats and the Republicans when the annual conventions happen or the, every four years during the election season and, and for other sorts of political purposes. We go to stadiums for a bunch of reasons. And so and, and then looking at this dynamic in American history showed me that, in fact, that it really has had this 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 function well beyond the, the, the role of entertainment, which we, which we typically think of. And so and so that's how I, that's really kind of that became like a journey through American history through the lens of this institution. Well, you certainly is, and we're going to delve into that. But I, what what caught me about the book, well, first of all, was the title, The Stadium. But the way you, you phrase the subtitle, it, which is Politics, Protest, and Play. Play being the third, not the first word. So what drove you to do that, Frank? Yeah, so. be because the stadium 
by nature, by its very existence is contingent on politics, right? And that's always been the case when they first started emerging in this country in the late 19th century and the decades after the Civil War. Even when they were privately owned, in order to build them, the local sports entrepreneur or the entertainment entrepreneur had to have political connections to build them, had to secure the land, had to secure transportation networks, et cetera, and so on. And so, and then as the state became, as the stadium became publicly owned, and they pretty much are for the most part, with some exceptions to this day, you know, their very existence is contingent on politics, on the mobilization of public resources to build them and to maintain them, right? And so you know, they look like these buildings that are, you know, like uh, monuments to uh, your local corporation or national or global corporation, but more often than not, the stadium is publicly owned. Therefore, it's contingent on political processes to make them happen. Right. Now, as every college football fan knows, um, there are bowl games at the end of the year. Whether with the new system we'll have, still have bowl games, I have no idea. Exactly. But once upon a time, we still have the Sugar Bowl. And you tell the story, which was located in uh, Tulane Stadium, which was new to me. I think of it as uh, some other place in, in New Orleans. Um, the race issue, uh, because this is in the South. Um, black players were not permitted. Tell us that story, Frank, if you would, please. Sure, John. You know, the stadium is a place where the status quo is in, is sort of celebrated and, and reinscribed, and it's also the place where the status quo is challenged. And by telling the story of the Sugar Bowl Classic, which is the New Year's Day college football football uh, uh, postseason bowl game, which still exists to this day, even though it's overshadowed by these other um, college football postseason games now, you know, became the kind of the epicenter of Southern college football in the first half of the 20th century. So the Sugar Bowl was held at, in the campus of Tulane Stadium, uh, at Tulane University at Tulane Stadium before it moved to the Louisiana Superdome in 1975, where it, where it, where it staged uh, to this day. And it really became a place where, not, not just where people go to go went to see football games, but really to sort of celebrate the Jim Crow order of the South, the racist, white supremacist order of the South. And you see this very clearly if you just click on YouTube, and watch highlights of many of the Sugar Bowl games that are on online and available in, in the archives, as I consulted, where in a lot of ways, the Sugar Bowl became this symbolic place to reenact national reconciliation after the Civil War, right? And so this is all the celebra celebration of the Confederacy, the kind of whitewashing of the Southern plantation past, indeed naming the, the bowl after sugar, a commodity that was produced by enslaved labor is an example of that, right? And so in the pregame pageantry and the halftime shows, you know, we see the white South celebrating itself for a national stage, particularly as the game was televised uh, on TV and on radio. And that's pretty much what it was until, until the long struggle of desegregation by civil rights activists really produced eventually an integrated game and integrated Southern sports environment, but that's not until the late 1960s and early 70s. And so to me, the Sugar Bowl story, you know, really exemplifies the ways in which a stadium structure, you know, can, you know, literally house and, and showcase the society's aspirations. And in that case, it was the White South at the time. Great. Now, also another point of social protest or innovation, whatever, was in a chapter you call the inner sanctum, which is the locker room. And um, guess who was not allowed? Women, <coughs> which uh, women reporters. <coughs> Excuse me. Don't tell us. <coughs> Excuse me. Right? <laughs> Please. <coughs> Apologies. Um, Please tell us that story. Yeah, you know, stadiums were, you know, I mean, the, the, the fascinating thing about stadiums is they're built to attract people, but they also are places where exclusion happened, right? That showcase the elite power or governmental power. And so the the story of, of the inner sanctums is about the ways in which women fought for the right to cover sports just like men. Uh, you know, we know the story of, the, of women athletes struggling, you know, in the feminist era, in the, I mean, throughout American history, but certainly in the 1960s and 70s with second wave feminism. You know, we see the ways in which women are struggling to get on, on, on the field of play, uh, most famously by the efforts of Billie Jean King and people like that. But the story I tell in this book are the ways in which, inspired by the second, feminist, fe uh, second wave feminist movement, we see women fighting really for the right to cover sports like men. And in order to do that, they had to fight for their right to access the place of work, which was the press box and the locker room, which was totally closed off to women in that period. And so the, the book shows us how women waged that struggle until the very famous 1978 legal case, which, uh, which allowed Melissa Ludke, as a, who's an inspiring sports writer for Sports Illustrated, to finally get access to the New York Yankees locker room. 
Uh, and she files a lawsuit. Uh, well, her boss is a uh, Time Life at Sports Illustrated filed the lawsuit. And they argued that the, ex the policies of excluding women from the locker room was against uh, civil rights laws. And it was. And that law, you know, that decision uh, by Constant Baker Motley, the very famous black woman judge who ruled in that case, basically set in motion this long process by which women could get access to the to the journalism world uh, at this at, in, in terms of sports journalism during the 1980s and, and really up until the present. I mean, sexism still pervades sports journalism, but it's a very different environment than it was in the 1970s that I write about in this book. All right. Now, there's another element um, contained in your book, but it's also vital to stadiums, and people know it, and that's the uh, music venues. Now, there was an interesting story that you tell um, about um, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Watts Stacks yes. 72. So tell us the story of um, how Stacks Records came to Los Angeles and why. So. It's in the 1960s where we start to see stadiums being used for music for music uh, events, right? I mean, it had existed before, but the music industry discovers that, wow, we can make a lot of money uh, if we pack stadiums with fans, right? To see the Beatles most famously at Shea Stadium in 1965, right? But it's at the same time we see, you know, black music acts moving into stadiums and arenas throughout the country. And some of those efforts were really inspired by black freedom and civil rights activism. And that's really the story of the 1972 Watts Sachs concert, which was held at the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. 100,000 people descended on the Coliseum to see the leading soul performers of the day who were, had been recorded with Stacks Records, a very famous record company that was based in Memphis, Tennessee. But what Stacks did that year is they partnered with local civil rights activists in Los Angeles to create the memorial concert to uh, memorialize the 1965 Watts uprising that broke out in Los Angeles seven years before and to raise money for the black community in Los Angeles. And so there at the Coliseum, we're seeing not just a concert, but a memorial, uh, uh, in many ways, a, a political rally that's celebrating and advocating for the rights of black people in, the, in those years, you know, four years after Martin Luther King was assassinated. And you can see this very uh, <laughs> the concert very famously in the very famous film Watt Stacks, which was edited, which was uh, produced by David Wolper Records. And so the Watt Stacks story to me is not just about a concert story; it's about how a public venue like the Coliseum became the space to showcase the aspirations of the black community in the early 1970s. Right. So we and part of it is an extension of the civil rights, if I may, with women, of course, and uh, uh, <clears throat> blacks. Um, there's another element that you touch on, and it's um, stadiums became a venue for advocating for um, gay rights. There were the gay games in San Francisco that you write about, but there was something curious happened in Shea Stadium in 1988, uh, ACT UP, a gay rights organization focused on the AIDS crisis. Tell us that story, Frank. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the book is really trying to show how the great social movements of the mid 20th century change American society and how the stadium became the place where we can kind of track those changes. So yes, uh, by the by the early mid 1980s, the United States is in the midst of a horrific AIDS crisis, right? Where people are dying uh, in a moment when the Reagan administration actually refused to acknowledge that the, the fact that AIDS was actually existed. And so you had this very inventive group, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, ACT UP, you know, stage a massive campaign in New York and other places of the country to make the AIDS crisis known and to demand that the state do something about it. And one of the things they do is they stage this very ingenious protest at New York Shea Stadium at a New York Mets baseball game in May 1988, in which they buy a bunch of seats in the upper deck and they you know, have essentially a rally in the upper deck and they get the New York Mets to actually put these kind of public service messages to tell the, the world that AIDS is affecting not just gay men, but also heterosexual people as well, right? And so they're able to do this because Shea Stadium was a public institution, again, right? And they actually got the collaboration of the Mets. I mean, it's actually a fascinating story. I mean, it's to the point where, where they're able to even like, you know, demonstrate their, their sexuality very publicly in, in the stadium space. So, and the way that uh, Maxine Wolf, the great uh, AIDS activist, uh, tells the story, she says that, you know, we all have to acknowledge that, well, you know, gay people actually go to games also. So, right. And so that's part of the reason why they had, you know, that's part of the reason why they decided to stage the protest there to reach the, a, a large amount of people that they could to tell the world about this crisis that was affecting, you know, everyone. Not and, just I think, and I think the lesson there is, of course, that stadium and you, you have a theme throughout the book, if I understood correctly, that 
Um, it's a public venue. And just what you said, I mean, um, <clears throat> the homosexual community was marginalized through most of American history, or <laughs> world history, shall we say. Yeah. And But by having an event like at the, a sports stadium perceived as a male domain, you know, macho, heterosexual, but no, it's also, as you said, gay uh, customers too, but also uh, men, and quote, normalized, if I can say that, um, uh, ad, began to normalize attitudes toward, my goodness, gay people are human too. Do you have a perspective on that? So Absolutely. I mean, I think that that's, that certainly was the point of, of, that, of that movement. And, and the same thing with the gay gays movement in San Francisco, right? I mean, I think the idea was, uh, to demonstrate, uh, you know, that these are communities that have the same aspirations everybody else does, but also to showcase their differences as well. I mean, it's an interesting tension that you see in the gay games movement there around that question. But the stadium becomes the place to, to demonstrate. I think that's the thing that I really want the reader to understand that. And it's because, it's particularly at that time, these are buildings that were conceived as civic monuments that had a larger political purpose, a public purpose. I think that, that, that purpose has gotten lost in recent decades, and that's part of the story of the book as well. There's another element in your book that I want to touch on, but I want to take a step back in my own thing. As you as a historian would know that the, <clears throat> the British Empire used to say that its conquest, its domination of significant portions of the world, continents, shall we say, was won on the playing fields of Eton, meaning cricket. Okay, <laughs> So we have American football, which its roots are in a sense, militaristic. I mean, uh, Eisenhower was very proud of being a West Point cadet who played football and injured his knee and it bothered him the rest of his life. But that's beside the point. But um, And we've always had uh, the infusion of the military into public spectacle. And it's an, perceived as an element of patriotism. What, what do you see in the merging of sports and the military, Frank? So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so as you say, I mean, uh, football's connections to patriotism and American politics go deep, right? They go certainly, I mean, back to the, you know, the, again, the late 19th century when the sport emerges, right? And when the national anthem becomes, uh, the Star Spangled Banner becomes a national anthem in 1931, and when the performance of the anthem of the Star Spangled Banner becomes normalized and regularized, which is not until really the 1940s, you know, we see a kind of militaristic culture, even if it's just in the, in the stage of the national anthem before it games. But what happens after September 11th is that, you know, patriotism and militarized patriotism really become amplified, right? Because of the ways in which the Bush and the Obama administration continue to try to drum up support for the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And one of the best places to do that is the American stadium, and in particular at NFL games, given its long connection to militarism, right? They go back to, like you said, the 19th century, right? So, so that's the story I also tell in this book, the ways in which the NFL and, and other leagues too, it's not just the NFL, but the NFL in particular, because it becomes the most popular spectator sport in this country, and it still is to this day, right? It becomes the, the, an important place to stage the kind of justification for the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, just like it did during the Vietnam era as well, but it's way more pronounced. So the jet flyover is the kind of elaboration of very patriotic rituals, the honoring of veterans in ways that, you know, that the, the creation of baseball games of the, the, the God Bless America tradition, which becomes part of the seventh inning stretch, which is again, the post 9-11 phenomenon. We see this amplification of the celebration of the military, but also law enforcement as well, right? And I think that's very much a product of the last 20, 20 plus years since 9-11. Well, as you touch on law enforcement, there's a, a backstory, and you have an eloquent phrase in your book called the, um, the stadium being a barometer of democracy. Well, that certainly comes into the, I mean, that's a wonderful statement, but there's another side of that, and it's the story of Colin Kaepernick, who took a knee during the national anthem as his protest to um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the killing of black uh, men uh, by uh, police. So what was the, we, we know the story, but what, what did you want to dimensionalize in, that, in, in telling that story? Frank. Yeah, I think that the protests of Kaepernick and uh, Maya Moore and, and scores of other WNBA players and elsewhere, you know, demonstrate, you know, once again, the impact of the black freedom movement on American political culture with the movement for black lives, you know, standing in solidarity against police violence against black people. But again, to sort of show the ways in which dissent have been, you know, 
you know, really intolerated in ways that I, I think were different in this post 9-11 moment than what we exist, we had seen before. I mean, it, by no means that, that sports fans want to see protests at, at games, you know, it, it, before 9-11. I'm not saying that, but I, I am saying that the reaction to Kaepernick was much more virulent and repressive uh, to the point where he was never able to play an NFL game after, as everybody knows, after 2016 when he staged his protest, right? So, so I think what we're seeing at the ballpark is, you know, the ways in which dissent was circumscribed and narrowed in ways that really hadn't existed, at least during the mid-20th century, as I'm trying to show in the book, when, when I think that because, again, the building was seen as a place that was open to all sorts of activities, including rallies, including protests, you know, I think we see this belief of, of sports only being, uh, stadiums only being a place where people should just shut up and dribble. I mean, I think that's very much a, a, a phenomenon of the last 30 years as we've seen dissent, you know, really circumscribed and criminalized in many, many parts of the United States. And, and, and the stadium is one of those places where you see that. So I think the stadium, again, becomes a place where we can see how democratization happens and, you know, and expands and also contracts. And I think what we've seen since 9-11 is a contraction for the most part. Now, there's another theme or sub-theme in your book, which isn't in the subtitle, which is American Stadium, Politics, Protests, and Sports. And I'll say that's commercialism. Yeah. <laughs> so whenever you go into a stadium, there's a little bit of advertising going on. And also the naming of stadiums, uh, named corporate sponsors. So what has that, how it, has that changed the nature of stadiums? And what's your perspective on that? Uh, Frank, I'm sorry. commercialism has been part of stadium culture from the very beginning, right? Uh, you know, again, the, the, those who build the initial structures or, you know, entrepreneurs who want to stage baseball games, want to make money from baseball. And so, you know, I traced the long history between baseball and beer companies throughout the, the, the history. And you see that very clearly in the history of scoreboards, right? And the ways in which beer uh, companies, local beer companies, not the national ones until much later, were, you know, very much part of the stadium ambiance, right? But what happens after the late 1980s, as corporations get more and more invested in the sports industry, you start to see the stadium environment change. You start to see the advent of naming rights, when which corporations pay money to put their names on buildings. We see unprecedented sports advertising. We see the proliferation of advertisements, not just around scoreboards, but all over the stadium space. I mean, you walk into an arena or a stadium today, you're assaulted by, you know, advertising every square inch of, of the building, right? Uh, whereas in the 1970s, you know, there's debates in the press about, you know, public buildings like the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum should have no advertisements, right? So the sensibility about advertisements in the stadium space has radically changed, right? Okay. And it's affected the layout and the experience of the stadium space, also correlating with the fact that most of these venues are constructed for a very affluent fan, a fan base, where it was just out of, so it's an experience that's really much more out of the reach of Americans than it used to be. Well, speaking of affluence, there's the new thing, or I don't know how new it is, but it's more um, it has you know gone from the professional to the collegiate ranks, and that's the luxury suite. So, yes. um, do you sense that creating a kind of it is an echo, the haves and the have nots right in your face? <laughs> What's your perspective on that, Frank? So, yeah, yes, it has. I think it has. I think it's unfortunate you know, dynamic as, as the stadium was remade into this imagined um, tool of economic, you know, development, which is what the argument that we often hear now that why we should, be, cities should build stadiums, many sports franchises argue, because it generates economic development. When economists have shown over and over again that it does not, it generates economic activity, right? But it's really just about the reallocation of public resources from one thing to a stadium. That's it, right? And because it's so costly to build and maintain, you know, they usually don't result in any sort of significant surplus for the stadium builder or for the cities who, who finance them, right? So there's that question. And then there's the question of, okay, that, so now most of these buildings on public funds are built for an affluent fan base. You see that clearly in the design of stadiums to this day, right? Um, you know, the proliferation of VIP suites and premium seating, the reduction of seats for, for average uh, Americans, right? And working class Americans, right? It's very much a phenomenon of the last 30 years when the stadium has become corporatized, become an enclave of exclusivity, as I argue in the book. And it's a cruel irony because many of these structures are or are often in, you know, in proximity to impoverished or working class neighborhoods. So you're seeing this like this edifice become a temple of exclusion for surrounding communities. And that's been an unfortunate you know, aspect of the stadium space over the last 30 years. 
Well, <clears throat> yeah, and that's that's a, a drawback with uh, <laughs> we're wrestling with now. Um, going to the stadium for many people. I mean, I, I remember vividly the first ball game I ever went to, Tiger Stadium. I got to see the New York Yankees, who were then my favorite team. Don't tell anybody that, Frank, because I'm, <laughs> I'm John Howard. and I. <laughs> just our secret, okay? But I was just overwhelmed as a 10-year-old seeing I got to see the Mickey Mantle and Whitey Ford and all those. But I never – I remember this vivid – I've never seen anything so green in my whole life, meaning the, the field, but also the ways and fans and, and all that kind of stuff. So, it, and then later I be, you know, attended many, I was a season ticket holder at Michigan Stadium for 25 years. But uh, so it, it's a, I understand the ritual of going to games. And as you mentioned, going to games with your father and many of my friends, the same kind of thing. So, What's the future of the stadium? Is it going to be more Jerry Jones, or are we going to go back to Triple A or I mean Double uh, A stadiums? What do you see? So. Yeah, you know, I you know because the, the, the sports industry is so dominant. I mean, one of the, the major three of the threads of this book is really attracts the impact of the sports industry and how it really, in some ways, has you know colonized the stadium space and really it, it's just, it's really most stadiums now are built for the, for their purposes in mind only in the, in the public secondary. You know, I'd like to think as a historian that at some point the limits of this model, which is just keep building them and building them, you know, sports specific stadiums and then make them, you know, make them cater to affluent um, class. That at some point that that's gonna have to run out uh, because if, for no other reason, because there's only so many cities that, you know, can build stadiums for you. Um, unless you just tear them down, which may be possible. So, so I mean, this is really about the larger question of, of, of corporate accountability and the way in which we, we hold our elected officials accountable. I think that's really, you know, in some ways this book is a, is a challenge to Americans. Like we need to make our public leaders, our uh, politicians and corporations much more accountable to a public than what we do. And I think if we're able to do that, and then we've seen instances where we've seen that, or we've seen the revival of the of the of the civic structure of the stadium when we saw a stadium voting during the 2020 election, for example, which I talk about. And I think there's possibilities to reimagine what this institution can be for us. And I think since it's happened in the past, you know, I, I don't see why it wouldn't happen in the future, even though it doesn't seem like there's an any end to this sort of you know the kind of current trend that we see right now. Right. Well, toward that end, you have a lovely passage in toward the end of the book, the conclusion, I think. Um, and I may I ask you to read that for us, please. So. Certainly. I'm glad you see. I'm glad you think it's lovely. <laughs> so, yeah, this is it's sort of an argument. I just I kind of I kind of made this argument already. So I'll read it here in the conclusion. The long history of the American stadium suggests that it plays the role of public institution, irrespective of the nature of its ownership. Invested in this, investing in the stadium is best understood as a commitment to a public good, akin to budgeting for public parks and other public institutions that facilitate community co cohesion. Yeah, and I think I, I write that to say that, you know, even when they're privately financed, I mean, the stadium and sports and, and that whole culture is so deeply embedded in our society that it really behooves us to, to, to reimagine it in a way that, that could be for, for a larger or better good. And I think we've done that in the past, at least in certain moments. And I think that's what this book is trying to show. Well, a theme of my show and Grace Under Pressure is community. And so I like the way you talk about community cohesion. And as you know, Frank, I ask every guest a story about Grace. Do you have one you want to share with us, please? So. I do. I'm so glad you asked that question because it's a real good practice to, to to kind of meditate on grace in one's life, especially when we get really busy. You know, to me, I actually find grace on, on the softball diamond these days. I'm a, I'm a coach of my daughter's softball team. She's in high school now. And I, there is nothing better right now. There's some things better. But one of the, my the experiences I live for is to help a kid get better on the baseball diamond, is to you know figure out what makes them tick. And then push them and see them overcome fear, see them overcome their obstacles, and see them fail and try again. Uh, you know, it's an experience I also have in the classroom with my students, which, you know, I live for that. I live to see young people learn about what they can do and see if they can do better. And I like to think of myself as a catalyst in that process, as a teacher and as a coach. And when it happens, it's, it, just, it just makes my heart sing. And, I, and it puts me in a state of grace. And so, yeah, that's, that's the story that that comes to mind uh, in response to your question. Thanks for asking. I, I love that. And of all the stories I've had on Grace, I don't know if anyone's talked about coaching youth uh, sports. So thank you, Frank. <laughs> so the name of your book is, um, is uh, The Stadium, An American History of Politics, Protest, and Play. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's a wonderful work. Frank, how can people find you? 
I am easy to find on the internet. You know, I'm on uh, Twitter X at F Garitti, you know, my first initial and last name, also on Instagram. And, you know, I, I'm, you Google me and you will, you'll find my email and I'm easy to contact. So please do if you have any reflections or questions about the book. Great. Well, Frank Garitti, it's been such a pleasure to have you on this show. And with that, we are going to close out. So, um, Awesome.